La clase está basada en lo que son máquinas, CNC machines, cualquier máquina con tal que tenga un, un computador que diga a la máquina cómo hacer el trabajo. Me considero una persona práctica y me encanta mucho lo que es las matemáticas, lo que es ciencias, so que ahí estoy yo. Este hacía un poco difícil por el idioma. Un profesor nos ayudó mucho en el vocabulario, bastante en el vocabulario. Y creo que yo esa es una ayuda, una ayuda muy importante. Uno se puede hacer la vida difícil, nomás con pensar en los problemas. Hay una teoría que para cada problema hay una solución. Y es verdad, siempre hay solución para todo. Esta actitud me ha ayudado mucho a salir adelante. Le tengo a mi hijo, los dos, yo vivo solo con él. Hay programas también acá que ayudan a madres solteras, que a veces, a veces las madres necesitamos un día off. Y este programa te cuida al nene por unas 3, 4 horas para que una tenga su respira, porque a veces sí lo necesitamos. El estrés también mata, también nos envejece. Si le das el empeño, lo vas a lograr. Si le das la actitud, el coraje, la confianza, lo vas a hacer. A mí, cualquier cosa que veo yo que tenga números, re emocionada, re emocionada. Y especialmente si es dibujo, dibujo técnico, me encanta. A mí me gusta mucho calcular y me gusta mucho hacer cosas con mis manos también. El desafío ahora es terminar. Lo que espero en cinco años es progresar. Verme ya progresada, ya realizada, más centrada. Eso es lo que yo espero verme ahorita en cinco años. El haber estudiado y trabajado con máquinas creo que me ha ayudado a desenvolverme un poco más y no tenerle ese miedo. Esa curiosidad me ha ayudado mucho a desempeñar este tipo de trabajo, lo que son máquinas, que mayormente casi no ves muchas mujeres haciendo. Justo sin pensarlo, mi trabajo está, está construyendo, está programando para personas con CNC experience, experiencias con CNC y máquinas para agarrarlos en el trabajo. Si tú vas a empezar algo pensando que es algo difícil, va a ser difícil para toda tu vida. El idioma no creo que sea el problema. El ser mujer no es problema, el vivir sola no es problema, porque me tienes acá presente. Para más información sobre este programa, visite nuestra página de internet, atetv.org. Gracias por su atención. Okay, I could see you all a minute ago and now I can't see anyone, but welcome to the ATE Principal Investigators Conference. It is always such a pleasure to be up here and to, uh, when I can, see all of you. Welcome you here. Uh, I guess since we started with the, uh, with the Hispanic videos, I should say good evening and buenas noches. Um, just to, you know, bring everybody here together. Uh, it is always a pleasure to be here, and uh, I think at this point, um, Ellen, are we still, are we okay as far as timing? 
Okay, all right, so we're, we're doing fine. So before we get started, first of all, I'd like to welcome all of you here. Um, I would like to call out the, excuse me, the fact that we have over 60 students. Any students wanna raise their hands and kind of wave? Right? All right. So we're really all here because of you. So I think that's one of the things I hope you, you keep in mind. I know we have a, a great program for the students and also for all of us. Remember, the students will be showcasing in, in each of the showcase events. So please try and take some time, go find the students, talk to them about their research, and get to know them a little bit. So I'd also like to welcome all of the first-time awardees. Another wave. Everybody who just is entering the ATE community, welcome. You, you really are joining a, an amazing community, and, and, I, and I mean that in the best sense of the word. Um, I know it uh, started with some of the pre-conference workshops today, and, and people were saying over and over again, this is a community, ask, ask, and ask again. You're going to find someone who will help you. I know last year I sent out some emails um, sort of late in the game saying, hey, everybody, you're supposed to showcase, and it's really important that you do. Um, I'd like to tell you what a few people who cornered me last year said. They said, we're so glad you made us do that. We were kind of nervous about showcasing initially, but my gosh, we met so many people. We made, we, we made, we, we've got new colleagues. We've got people who want to partner with us on our project. So take advantage of that. You know, this is, this is not that usual uh, a conference that, that, we, that we want to start taking it for granted. We want to use it. Networking is some, one of the things that comes up as one of the top marks on every survey that you all fill out each year. So really meet new people. You know, um, matter of fact, if you don't know the person next to you, turn around and, and introduce yourselves and, and, uh, and say hello. <laughs> This is good. I can, I can tell this is going to be a great conference. <laughs> okay, so you've already made some new friends. Uh, this, is, this is a great thing. You want to keep this up. Remember, we've got all the showcase events and all the concurrent sessions to come. Um, I'd also like to, to um, acknowledge uh, Really, first of all, the American Association of Community Colleges, and especially Ellen Haas and her team, because if they weren't pulling this conference together, we all work on it. Everyone with, within NSF and the ATE program works on it. But it's really Ellen who is the driver and the American Association of Community College who has been staunch, not just a supporter, but a partner in this program since this program began. So I'd like to acknowledge the American Association of Community Colleges. Okay, so second of all, I would also like to acknowledge the fact that there's a fairly large steering committee of people that Ellen Haas brings together. We actually don't get much downtime, right? It's end of October. Ellen is going to start getting us together in late January, early February to start planning for next year's conference. And I would like to acknowledge all of the uh, committee members who put in a lot of time helping plan the conference, uh, come up with a theme, help uh, set up concurrent sessions. So if we could give a hand to all of the steering committee members, that would be great. Okay, so it's my pleasure to be um, the person who gets to introduce our first welcoming speaker, which is Dr. Mary Graham, um, who has been the president of Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College since 2011 and is the current chair of the board of the American Association of Community Colleges. And um, I think all of you know, but I'm just going to say that um, AACC is the, is the primary advocacy organization for the over 1,100 community colleges in the United States, and AACC is located here in Washington, D.C. So that's a very brief intro for Mary, but we very much are glad that you're here, and thank you very much for being here to welcome us all. Well, good evening. Come on, folks. I flew from Mississippi. You could do better than that. Good evening. That's better. That's better. Well, on behalf of the American Association of Community Colleges, I want to welcome you to your nation's capital.
We're so excited to have such a great turnout for this wonderful conference, the ATE Principal Investigators Conference. And I want to commend the panel, Celeste and, and all the folks, Ellen, that worked so diligently because the theme this year is spot on, hands on, minds on. That's exactly what we're trying to do with America's workforce. So congratulations on that. This year's conference represents a lot of different constituents, community colleges, universities, four-year colleges, business and industry, secondary. There's so many people involved in this type of effort. And so, again, we're thrilled that you're here. And I'm thrilled to know that there are over 60 students attending the ATE conference, along with some recent alumni. I met a couple of them in the elevator, and they seem delighted to be here. And I know that many of you during the conference and possibly uh, toward the end of the conference will be meeting with your congressional leaders. I would encourage you to take your students with you. They have as much impact of, as any of us with our leaders in Congress. And today, more than ever, it's so critical that we continue to forge those relationships with our congressional leaders. We continue to share with them the importance of STEM education, technology, and the importance of standing up a strong workforce. So I encourage you to do that. I also want to thank the leaders who have dedicated themselves to this mission. Your work matters. I'll say that again because often some of you may not feel like your work in STEM and ATE matters, but your work matters. It matters for the future and for our global competitiveness in the United States. So remember that. Your persistence, your innovation in developing a strong STEM technician education program in response to industry needs, so, so very critical. They, again, I say, they help sustain the U.S. economy. Since 1920, the American Association of Community Colleges has advocated for the same things that you guys are advocating for today, for two-year college students, for technical education. And we have enjoyed a wonderful partnership with NSF over the last 23 years. They've helped to build this ATE community through the annual conference, through other STEM activities, and some of you may be familiar with the Mentor Links program. Thank you, NSF. We appreciate and, uh, and value your partnership. And we look forward to continuing that partnership to do some new and innovative things. Over the last year, Celeste alluded to it, there's been a lot of work to create and bring a wonderful conference here this week. And I would like to thank those leaders, as she did. Thank you for bringing forward critical issues and opportunities related to advanced technological education. It's important that we continue the conversation. Now, more than ever, the future of community colleges, STEM, technological education, it keeps us competitive. But more than being competitive, we want to be number one. We want to be number one in the United States, so we have to continue to strive and work hard. Thank you again for the important role that each and every one of you play by participating in this conference this week. It is important that we continue to grow our STEM leaders. It's important we continue to nurture our young people. Hands on, minds on. Again, a great theme for a great conference. I wish you all the best for your continued success Enjoy the conference. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so thanks. I'm Dave Campbell. I'm the co-lead of ATE. Celeste is my partner in crime. Uh, I'm in the Division of Research on Learning. Celeste is in the Division of Undergraduate Education. And I get to introduce Celeste's division director because I have jury duty Wednesday morning and she's going to introduce my division director. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Robin Wright. Um, Robin is um, the division director of the Division of Undergraduate Education. She's a professor in the Department of Genetics, Cell Biology, and Development at University of Minnesota, also the associate dean for faculty and academic affairs. And University of Minnesota has let us uh, borrow her for a couple of years. Uh, she's won many awards. Uh, two that stood out to me is uh, she's a AAAS Science Fellow, 
Uh, and a couple of years ago, she won the Elizabeth Jones Award for Excellence in Education from the Genetics Society of America. Uh, but a couple of fun facts. She teaches these freshman seminars, and one was called Alien Biology, and the other one's called Death by Hamburger. So you can ask her about those later on. And this morning, we had an all-hands meeting in our directorate, and um, she's very happy to be here at NSF. She said the Division of Undergraduate Education is the bomb. So without further ado, Dr. Robin Wright. Boy, it is really bright here. Um, well, you know, Celeste is a force of nature, isn't she? She's <laughs> really amazing. I don't think I realized I was supposed to speak here until we were in the metro and my colleagues told me on the way over here. Um, but I want to say that I think that, seriously. <laughs> but, you know, when Celeste says, will you, you say yes, and then you find out later whatever you said yes to. So um, it's really wonderful. Um, the ATE program is truly one of the gems in the NSF crown. It is um, when we, it's our go-to program when we want to talk about the impact of, the, of our work and our funding. So we really are appreciative. I want to add my thanks to each and every one of you who are working with amazing students and amazing programs and doing amazing innovative things. Um, we're only starting to talk about workforce development and competencies in, um, in my institution, but it's coming all around. So you're way ahead of the game in that. It's a real honor for me to introduce um, my boss, um, Jim Lewis. He is a very dedicated, visionary, interesting leader and an interesting person to work with as well. I, I really admire him. I've only been here since May and I've learned many, many things from Jim. And um, I did look up his, his CV right now. <laughs> My colleagues, thank goodness for the internet, right? And there are some things about, um, about Jim that I didn't know. Uh, first of all, I knew he was from the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And I knew that uh, he was a mathematics professor there, and he is the director of the Center for Science, Mathematics, and Computer Education. Now, um, I didn't realize it, but if you listen, when you listen to him talk, see if you can't realize this. He graduated, he earned his PhD from LSU, Louisiana State University, so see if you can hear that when he's talking. He's won many awards, including an NSF Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring. He, has, he was the university's Outstanding Teaching and Instructional Creativity Award and the Carnegie Foundation's 2010 Nebraska Professor of the Year. Isn't that amazing? It's really good. Um, he also won a Chancellor's uh, Award for, this, for his support of opportunities for women in mathematical sciences. I know that he'll um, add his welcome to, to the ones that you've had today, but Jim, thanks so much for your leadership. Thanks, Robin, and, and good evening. I'm pleased to join you for the ATE conference. I want to bring greetings from Joan Fernimundi. She's our chief operating officer, and she was scheduled to speak, but the director thought that she should go with the director to Berkeley today, <laughs> so she's in Berkeley today. I also want to thank the American Association of Community Colleges for being a co-sponsor. Uh, they do a great job communicating both the needs and the importance of our nation's community colleges and their expertise has helped design this valuable conference to represent all involved in the ATE program. Since its exception more than two decades ago, NSF's ATE program has supported the development of a highly capable technological workforce that meets the needs of today's technology-driven workplace. The demand for technical workers is increasing in every sector of the economy, from agriculture, computer science, biotechnology, media design, technical writing, ecosystem management, and so many more. I'm sure you agree that educating a capable science and technology workforce is imperative to the nation's future economic security. I'm sure you know that the ATE program supports partnerships involving not just two-year colleges, but K-12 schools, four-year colleges, government, industry, we're very proud of these partnerships. ATE-funded programs are meeting critical regional and national needs. 
This kind of co cooperation is not easy, but we believe our ATE PIs and their colleagues are doing admirable work. It's worth noting that the development of a skilled technical workforce is of interest to the current administration. In June, the president kicked off the first Workforce Development Week, during which he announced major initiatives to promote apprenticeship and technical training programs. The president and his advisors are interested in understanding a productive partnership between industry and those that develop the workforce, and we believe that the ATE community has a lot to offer to what he wants to do. At NSF, our National Science Board is very interested in understanding the needs of the skilled technical workforce. At its May meeting, Celeste and I had a chance to make a presentation uh, on the ATE program and the development of the skilled technical workforce. The National Science Board then created a task force on the skilled technical workforce. It's really clear that your work is valued these days at the National Science Foundation and at the nation at large, perhaps now more than ever. Community colleges serve many different communities and serve roughly 40% of the nation's undergraduate students. It was estimated at 12.2 million in 2015. I'm sure that you all know that broadening participation is an important NSF priority. Here too, community colleges have a lot to offer because of the number of underrepresented students that you serve. For example, 36% of the students you serve are the first in their family to attend college, and more than half of the nation's Hispanic and Native American undergraduates attend community colleges. Clearly, community colleges serve as a gateway for many traditionally underrepresented students to pursue STEM education and careers. We need your help ensuring that high-quality STEM careers are possible for all students. I want to draw your attention to the NSF Includes initiative, one of our 10 big ideas. It focuses on broadening the participation of undergraduate groups in the workforce through innovative networks of stakeholders, schools, hit industry, government, professional organizations. If you're already involved, thank you. For all others, I invite you to take a look at our website and see how you might be involved Check out the Dear Colleague letter, which is asking for supplements to grants right at this time. Uh, learn about NSF Includes projects in your area. You may find some that work parallel to the work that you're already doing. To conclude, I want to mention a wonderful ATE award I learned about late last week. <clears throat> it's a recent award to Northland Community Technical College in Minnesota. Their award focuses on the advancement of geospatial information technology and unmanned aircraft systems, education and training. Celeste passed along a link to a press release about the award. One thing I appreciated in that press release is that it credited NSF. That doesn't always happen. <laughs> and it talked about partnerships that, it, that Northland was having with St. Cloud to educate workers from the local community. I passed this link on to our director she passed it on to a member of the National Science Board. So I want to encourage each of you to proceed in a similar manner. First, you write a great proposal that gets funded. Then do great work. Next, be sure that the world knows about your great work. And in the process, be sure that NSF gets credited. <laughs> Together, we can be sure that the nation knows about the great work and the, that is being supported by the ATE program. I look forward to hearing about your work. I hope you enjoy the conference. I want to turn the microphone back over to Dave Campbell to introduce tonight's speaker. Okay, as Dave said, we're partners in crime, so it's Celeste back up here, not Dave. Um, but it's, a, it's a, again, a tremendous pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening. And this is Mr. Mike Russo, who leads the Corporate Office of Government Affairs for Global Foundries. I know that there's at least some people who are very, know a lot about Global Foundries that are here in the audience, because when Global Foundries moved into, I believe it's Malta, New York, is that right? Malta, New York. One of the things they said they, they were going to need was a large number of entry-level technicians. And they went to the surrounding community and technical colleges and talked to them about partnering. And, uh, and, and we have a center, right, the Neotech Center is in Albany. 
And they've been working with Global Foundries since Global Foundries, I, I would bet almost since Global Foundries broke ground. So, um, so Mike is someone who, in addition to his work, where he is uh, uh, overseeing government relations, regulatory affairs, various strategic initiatives for a global company. He also really recognizes the importance of the technical workforce and has made a tremendous effort to partner with the community and technical colleges in, in, uh, in New York and beyond. And uh, so I think we're very, very lucky to have him as our plenary speaker. And uh, I would like to welcome him to the ATEPI conference. Well, hello everyone, good evening, and thank you, Celeste. And uh, I want to put a plug in for NSF. Uh, I don't want you ever to think that we don't appreciate NSF. So the, the, the spaces that, the NS, that NSF is in uh, is really remarkable. And one of the things that I'm, I, I do is I actually chair the executive committee for M Foresight, which is a private sector uh, advisory group to uh, private sector and the administration as re uh, related to manufacturing, advanced manufacturing. NSF is a, is a, a sponsor of that work as well. So whether it's ATE or well beyond that, NSF is really, gets, really gets it and understands where we have to really uh, target our resources. So that's an unsolicited plug for NSF. So, uh, and also thanks to uh, AACC for, for their work in AT, ATE. We had the, the program directors and, and leadership from uh, uh, the association here tonight. This is uh, actually, uh, uh, annually, it's a, it's a great convening, but I think as years go by, it's even more important. Uh, there was mentions of, uh, you know, making sure that we position the U.S. for, uh, when it comes to global competitive, competitiveness. I think that's part of it, but there's also another piece that people don't mention a lot in this space, but it's actually directly tied to national security. I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, I, I do a lot of work in manufacturing industrial based policy and working with the Department of Defense and have some perspectives there that, that I'd like to share. So um, first of all, uh, you mentioned my role. Part of what I do is lead strategic initiatives in the U.S. for our corporation as well. When I say strategic initiatives, uh, they're focused in areas that are important to the country that are aligned with our business. So beginning back when we first formed our company back in uh, 2009 timeframe, reached out to the then administration, actually to the president, to cabinet secretaries, undersecretaries, asking them, you know, introducing Global Foundries, uh, this is who we are, what can we do to help? And we have a different uh, model when it comes to government affairs. Instead of writing big checks and throwing them around and trying to be everyone's friend, it's developed true relationships based on carrying water that's tough to carry. So when it comes to strategic initiatives, think about uh, uh, areas that, that might make the most sense as far as priorities, things that would keep you up uh, at night if you were a president of the United States or are leading national officials. Interestingly enough, out of those areas, in talking to different secretaries, education and workforce development, now, back in 2009, it's, it's eight years ago, we first formed, we're a big startup. So I still say, so I don't know how long I'll get to say startup, but I'm gonna still use startup. Um, we, uh, education and workforce development was a top priority across all the agencies as well as the president. And interestingly enough, for different reasons, different perspectives. So when you talk to the Department of Defense back then, uh, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing or oversimplifying, but uh, the days of the point and shoot infantry are over. You need an educated uh, uh, military. When it comes to, uh, uh, if you talk to an international trade rep and competing globally in a global economy, you need a workforce, a qualified workforce that gives you the edge. If you talk to folks within the education department, and you all know that there's, that there's not just an education department, there's different portfolios and segments and silos within the education department. But for various reasons, uh, certain populations, and, and I'm not going to point to a specific population, but you, you, you know certain uh, populations that are, are, are really failing more so within the education system. And if you look at the growth of those populations within our society, that alone can sink our economy in, in, in 10 years. Um, and, and so as, as we wound our way through, and, and I had conversations at a very high level with then elected officials uh, uh, in, the, in that administration, it became apparent, apparent that education and workforce development was much more important than just to a global foundries. It was important to the country. Um, that really led to the final discussion we had within the White House and uh, 
um, uh, the, the then leader, said that, uh, you know, there's a lot of great work going on in the country. There's this school system doing great work, that teacher doing great work, uh, people throwing money in different directions around, you know, trying to uh, energize people around innovative practices and helping to grow. But you know what, if we could just connect the dots between those innovative practices, if you want to help, some, help us with something, nobody can seem to get that right. That's what we need you to do. Well, be careful when you ask what you can do to help, because uh, we spent about six months and led an initiative to figure out why isn't it being done or what is being done, what does it take to succeed, and we actually established a Connect the Dots initiative. And we set up a pilot uh, within New York State uh, where we were uh, building a, a brand new production facility for semiconductors there that encompassed 110 school districts, 345 schools, 20 chambers of commerce, and really, it's not, it wasn't intended to come up with the best, and, and own the best practice, but rather shine a light on great work. Survey the group and see, you know, what, who's doing what that, that they believe will advance the ball, that they're doing it in the darkness now, and how can we shine a light on it? And reaching out nationally through some of the, the uh, advisory groups and education on a national level that we were leading, you know, how can we take most innovative practices and plant them in a, in, a, in a big laboratory that has, it's small enough in upstate New York where not a lot of people care, right? It's upstate New York, it's whatever they do up there is okay, not as much politics. But uh, there's some uh, multicultural schools. There's uh, one school district has a very big Hispanic population. There's suburban and rural and there's inner city, but small. Un perfect for, a, for, a, for a, a, actually a, a model or a laboratory trial, uh, some initiatives. So at the time, we were uh, uh, building this advanced node fab. It was really, we felt, a perfect place to collaborate with our stakeholders that already said we're willing, right? It was kind of a greenfield, a uh, good foundational system. Global Foundries, and for those of you that don't know, we're, we're the, the only privately uh, held semiconductor contract chip maker in the world. We're the largest in the U.S., second largest in the world. Uh, and we, since we acquired IBM's microelectronics division back in the middle of 2015, we now have IBM's, we, we acquired that whole microelectronics div division. We're major suppliers to the Department of Defense for, for needed technologies. Um, so, uh, what does the investment look like in Malta, and why could we, why would people even listen to us, right? So, back then, during the worst economic downturn in a lifetime, we started, uh, we broke ground and, and, and built uh, the largest, most advanced foundry fab in the world, fab fabricator production facility. Uh, to date, we're right around $15 billion. It has around 3,600 uh, operational employees uh, working there, about $92,000 a year, uh, annual salary per employee, average. Um, and uh, the uh, interesting thing is it's fully automated. Uh, I, I sit on a, a board of the Business Council of New York and we had a, a person from the Wall Street Journal uh, talking to us uh, about a month or so ago and, and it was an interesting kind of a keynote or a discussion over lunch where he didn't have, pose the answers to the question, have the answers to the question, but posed the question, do we really need to be investing in manufacturing? Is there truly a payback for manufacturing? And in fact, does automation really uh, limit the, uh, the value of bringing manufacturing back to the US? And I thought about that. And, and I, so often I think about things outside of global foundries because of the other work that, I, that I'm involved in. And I said, wait a minute, let me just think about global foundries. There's an example of a very advanced manufacturer um, the, uh, um, if you look at the salaries and the amount of people working there, that facility would not even exist in the U.S. We're not reversing a trend, by the way. We're bucking a trend. There's a big difference there. Um, and uh, thought about it, said, you know what? Considering it's a closed loop system with no technicians actually that handle wafers, move them around, and operate equipment, they're all basically some form of an engineering, whether it's a two-year degree or right out of school or on the way up. I mean, it's pretty advanced. About 70% uh, of the workforce are PhDs. Uh, about 30 different engineering, uh, 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 different types of engineering careers uh, represented there. But uh, I would say that that's pretty high value. And it's, a very strate it's of strategic importance to, to the country and to the economy. If you think about the Internet of Things, you think about 5G and think about the way things are going, semiconductors are in everything. Uh, and the, the economies and the countries or the ecosystems that our leaders in innovation and technology development are absolutely going to be positioned to lead moving forward. And when you say lead moving forward, don't forget the national security perspective on that. Having a strong uh, manufacturing industrial base uh, with the proliferation of technology around the globe and, and, and really some nations that are not necessarily our friend having access to, to technology, 
The way to counter that is to outrun them, to be the innovative uh, uh, economy, to, to be able to stay one foot ahead of everybody when it comes to technology development. And we often hear that we're not investing as much as others should be, other nations, not even close to some other nations are in, in, uh, in R&D and technology development. And, you know, for an example, this, this China is probably about 150, 160 billion right now just in our industry alone trying to, you know, come up with a domestic uh, uh, semiconductor industry and supply chain. But we have other strengths that we absolutely can exploit. And some of those strengths are represented by you all in this room and by the 63 students, by the way, congratulations to uh, receiving the award. You know, should be very proud of the folks that, that come from those schools, that are passionate about what they do, to provide our country with, with leadership capabilities. And, and for those that are involved in the education system and academia and industry, I think it's incumbent on us to, to instill that passion and help people understand that there's a path forward so they, they, they know that regardless of where you come uh, from the level, from your social level, where you, know, where you come from in general, where you live, regardless of how big the budget is for your school district, that, that you have an opportunity and a path forward to be successful. Um, and and I, I, a friend of mine, uh, Dean came in uh, First Robotics, and we, we talk about these things all the time. Uh, he's one of the few people I could talk to and really get excited about, and uh, he, he's a passionate guy. The, uh, but uh, what he and I both believe in is, is really planting those seeds with our youth to get them excited. And I'll tell you, you can bring peace, peace to the world when you get kids thinking that way and talk to each other. We, we hosted, uh, he hosted and first hosted the first global first uh, uh, event here in, in town a, a month or two ago. Had 163 nations represented around the world, from around the world, uh, teams of four or five kids. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it was really powerful. And, and those kids will make a difference. So I would suggest that uh, we should look at our, take ourselves out of what we do in our daily lives and look at the bigger picture and look at the value that we can bring. And, and the re really the reason why we're here as educators, as industry leaders, as policy makers. And, and you know, the thing, I, I like to talk to older people. I always, for some reason, I've always been, some of my closest friends have been in their 80s and 90s even when I was a young kid. And I love the old stories. And I've never talked to an older person that was getting ready to kind of uh, sunset and said, you know, I, I, I wish I made more money or I wish I had spent, spent more time at work. They'll say things like, you know, I should have spent more time with my family or I should have really spent more time with kids or made some kind of a difference and made my mark. And you're all actually, we all, I'll include myself in that, we're in a position to make a mark and to go home every night with your head held high and know that you made a little difference. And how we can really make a difference, I think, is if we connect the dots between all of our activities and figure out how to scale and sustain them. And I'll bring it, I'll wrap it back to that original uh, model or, or pilot program that we stood up to connect the dots. We actually built that out in a way that it could be templated, could be scaled. I'm talking the connect the dots mechanism or vehicle can absolutely be picked up and scaled nationally. We have a, we have a playbook on that that, that could, be, could be scaled. So I, I think I'd like to, to challenge you all to think about how we might take a step out of our busy daily lives and paying our school's budgets if you're a community college president and doing all the things you have to do every day and say, what if we from the private sector actually drove with the support of some of our uh, public sector friends, uh, put together an initiative to truly make it easy to scale and, uh, and sustain those best practices and, and, and uh, stand that, I mean, if you look at what ATE funds, and it's those collaborative efforts, right? I, there's people really focused on that. I think there's, there's different regions that do this. There's different public and private sector entities do, do, that do pieces of this. But there's no reason why we can't do that in a comprehensive way across the country. And there's actually, there's actually a body of work that can help to make that happen. And, and this group is actually very, positioned very well to, uh, to do that. The, um, um, we talk about commitment of the, of the past administration. It carries over to this administration. That's actually refreshing. It's one of the few areas in today's politics that you could say there's actually agreement, right, left, one administration to the other administration, is that we need to invest in education and workforce development. Now, that's a simple way to put it, very high level. I know the devil's in the details, but just by the fact that you hear those comments is, is, is refreshing. So let's seize the moment, right? The, uh, back, going back to the previous administration, uh, once that, uh, that we found that there was a, um, a, a willingness in, in a direction, 
What we did is we actually said, all right, well, you know, you're going to have to do something here too. What? Help us create excitement. That led to two presidential visits and a visit by the vice president. And it's, it's costly, it's painful, but it's easy for him to do if it fits into the schedule. So bottom line is that regardless of what the, who the administration is, if there's passion there, we can take advantage of that, leverage that. There's agencies out there like the NSF that has done great work. And right now there's a time where all the agencies are being targeted for budget cuts. We need to make sure that people, regardless of the administration, understand what the value is of that work, to continue it, target it. There's nothing wrong with being conservative, quite frankly. But I, I'm going to mix two words that, that they don't mix today, is, is pro, pro, being a progressive and being a conservative. If you're a fiscal conservative, I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to get the most out of your money, right? But you need to be progressive. Progressive means looking forward. I think, if, I, think I saw the quote on the National History, Natural History Museum down in New York City from Teddy Roosevelt, Republican. The day we stop being progressive is the day the democracy dies. Well, we have ve the vehicles here within our, our own current structure and agencies to actually make a difference, be progressive in a good way that makes sense. We don't need agencies shooting in different directions, spending money uh, in, in different ways that are diametrically opposed, but rather take a razor sharp focus, count on some of the organizations that are really getting it done right, know it, you know, have years of, of, of understanding that, the space, and really kind of double down. Um, the, uh, I just want to bring it down to the, the level of, of some of the partnerships we have in the advanced node fab area. So I'm talking about from corporate level, corporate leadership, you know, we are heavily involved in the advanced manufacturing partnership and, and uh, leading the, the uh, discussions around the, standing up the NNMIs, the Institute's now Manufacturing USA, and creating a pathway uh, model to uh, 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 get people in a, in, a, in a comprehensive way on education pathways and all that. But, but the, the thing I'd like to talk about is State University of New York, just as an example. And uh, uh, Celeste, you mentioned Neotech, and that's one great example. And you're right, they have been very uh, instrumental in actually direct demand-driven education. Uh, that's why we've supported their funding uh, from, from day one, and they do great work. It's very cost-effective work. They're actually going to be partnering with us in, in uh, standing up a manufacturing technology education center near the advanced node fab in upstate New York that's really kind of modeled after the NNMI model. Uh, um, which I, I, was, I was a lead there in, in, in that, so I'm well aware of how that works uh, in that advisory group. So we took that model and we actually uh, brought it down to this kind of state and local level and with local manufacturers, folks like Neotech, and we said, how can we create a collaborative space where uh, we can use it for training, workforce development, R&D, robotics, two of the, both SESME, the Clean Energy Smart Manufacturing and Innovation Institute, and, and the Advanced Robotics Institute, um, our, uh, we'll have space there, be able to leverage the lab. We're going to put in place the automation equipment uh, that the ecosystem can use. Supply chain folks can use it as a test bed. It's a great space, very cost effective because we leverage the collective strength. And the State University of New York uh, is, uh, is, is heavily involved uh, with that initiative as well. So I'm just going to tick, uh, tick, uh, go down through a few of those. So we worked very hard with the State University in uh, making sure the first time around they were funded with the TAC grant. And it was interesting because uh, I know none of you are parochial in, in, in nature. You're not one of you try to sell your own brand over the community college next door, I'm sure, right? Uh, so we, I, I found out when I asked to meet with the regional community colleges, there were six presidents in the room, and I, I found out afterwards, the first time they had met with a private sector company, and you know, unless it was called, they were called to a meeting by the boss, they had never done that. So I asked some interesting questions. Maybe there's some folks in the room from there, and you'll remember this. I hope it wasn't too painful. But I said, I would go through all your websites, and I, I said, yeah, I look at the, you know, your courses that you offer, and it, wouldn't it make sense to have a common nomenclature? It wouldn't it make sense instead of you investing, putting this lab space up, and you, but what if you took, you know, I'll invest in this lab, you invest in that lab, and you share the space? And so I, what I had said is that uh, for the first kind of rounds of grants, we'll continue supporting individual grants, but thereafter, we're going to support grants that SUNY Central says are aligned with a common uh, goal. And there was a brand new SUNY chancellor at the time, uh, Nancy Zimfer, very passionate, and she wanted to change the model to you know, education, making sure it's demand driven and getting a value, value out of it versus just educating. And they're a very unique asset. There's 64 colleges and universities, 30, 30 community colleges. They actually have a person, Johanna Duncan Portier, I don't know if she's in the room, I can't see anybody because of the lights, so. But if you're here, Johanna, I'll embarrass you a little bit, but 
She's a very strategic asset in the state because she's responsible for the education pipeline in, in all the community colleges in the state, in the state system. Very cool. It's, that's the best practice we could emulate and, and, and replicate around, around, the, around the country. So uh, what we've done is really partnered very closely with SUNY on the TAC grant, you know, getting the community colleges together to get a proposal and actually lobbying for it. Uh, the, uh, the, we've actually established a few our early college high school programs that are focused on advanced manufacturing, and the goal is ultimately to get a Regents Diploma with the blue stamp on it that, uh, that a student can actually get their regular diploma, but by taking some other skills that, they, that are offered in our state through BOCES, but, uh, uh, New York State through BOCES, but uh, uh, think, of, think, think of some of the manufacturing-related uh, skills in, in, in coursework, uh, statistic process control. Uh, problem solving, hydraulics and pneumatics, uh, communication skills, just fundamental skills. And you get your regular high school diploma, but you have that bolted on. And what if you had some credits in your pocket to get the two-year the, the, the two degree after that? Get them on that path that's so important. One that's not costly, and they can jump on and jump off based on their interests. So uh, that actually led to uh, the support, our support of what's now P-TECH, which is a kind of a version of that. Uh, but there's a lot of inner city kids that would not have a, otherwise have a path forward that are taking advantage of that. So how can we take that and, and make it so it's available to everybody around the country? We're, we're leading an initiative called REAL. It's Robotics for Experiential and Applied Learning. Through my friend Dean Kamen, we've developed a robot that is very cost effective, very durable, and actually we, we think we can put it in every fourth grade classroom in the country. And we are we're working now on the model to scale and sustain it where they don't have to write big checks. And so no matter how poor the school, they might not have a roof, but they can have a robot. And we're going we're gonna to start that uh, in, in the region where the uh, FAB is in up, uh, upstate New York, but we're going to start it through the counties there. But the goal is to put it in every fourth grader's hands in the country. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm talking a little bit about myself here, but my children are 40 and 38 and 5. And I raised two as a single parent. I wasn't married in 2006, and that was a conscious choice. So for all of you smiling, thinking there was a mistake, it was not. We made that decision. And when he plays and, built with, and builds things, and he's well beyond, I mean, he blows me out of the water, right? And when I see he play, he, he has three little girlfriends he plays with. They all love to build. And I'll tell you what, we are absolutely going to give them something to play with and give them a chance to make a difference in the world. Um, and that's an example of, of I think, what, uh, you know, what we can do. And we talk about, like SUNY, they have the Empire State uh, Learning Network, where we have, there's 10 hubs. They're aligned with the regional economic development zones in New York State and try, trying to really c help to connect those dots. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a vehicle to do that within New York State. They uh, are one of three, one of three uh, uh, schools or school systems that uh, were awarded the Battelle STEMX uh, um, grant. So uh, they're going to be beginning that work next uh, year, beginning of the year. Uh, we're, we've partnered with them to develop a, a, a scalable and sustainable advanced manufacturing apprentice program. And we started on that, you know, sometimes it's slow. We started on that before it was kind of the buzzword, and we're getting closer to actually really making a difference. This, uh, the, by the way, SUNY's done, uh, done great work in, 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 in these types of programs. They've touched about 4,000 students, and they've worked with about 300 uh, uh, industries and, and businesses in the state. So I guess what I'll do is uh, I'll leave you all with a thought and maybe a challenge and hopefully a little bit of excitement and knowing that we can make a difference if we all point our passion in the same direction is why don't we all get together and figure out how to actually put together one, and maybe what we'll do is do a private sector competition and come, who actually wants to help to stand up this Connect the Dots initiative in a comprehensive way where no matter where you are in the country as far as a parent, a teacher, a student, you can log on and find out where, if, if I want to do, ec these are my passions, let it down select to what you might be suited for. Who offers that training and education? Uh, if I already have work experience and I'm an adult, where does that align with? And, and I, I, we've done a lot of work with that. I mean, we, we had done that in our pilot area and actually uh, led a working group with the press administration on how to set up a pathways piece. We absolutely, many here in the room have done some pieces of that. That's a grand challenge that I think that we could act, act this group could get their arms around. So whenever somebody delivers a keynote, I like to be a little bit aspirational and, and, and uh, uh, you know, have it, have it pertain to what you're talking about, but also uh, uh, kind of give, uh, you know, present a challenge. So that'll be the challenge I'm going to propose to the group. 
And with that, I'll, I guess I'll open up to a few minutes for uh, questions and answers. Does that make sense? I can't see hands and I can't see people. I can see you now. I'm out of the line of fire here. Boy, what an easy crowd. Wait, is, do they eat? Dinner's coming, right? Dinner's coming. Ah, I gotcha. No, I, I won't do that. So. Oh, over here. Hey, my name is Will Tyson. I'm from the University of South Florida, principal investigator of Pathetic Life. It's a study of a uh, national survey of factors that influence uh, whether or not students go into advanced technology programs. You said in your talk that the U.S. has advantages that we can exploit relative to other countries and that those advantages are in this room. Uh, one thing that has really become apparent kind of in our broader social and political landscape is that there's a real question about how do we sell advanced technology education and the pathway into the 21st century workforce in a society, particularly with a lot of populations that are kind of pining for 20th century jobs. How do we bridge those knowledge gaps and help move people into the 21st century and into the types of educational experiences, the hands-on, minds-on experiences that folks in this room provide and to prepare them, drag them in some cases, into the 21st century? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, yeah, we're live now. The, um, Great question. I don't have to. <laughs> you know, if, if, if you think about um, some of the current dynamic, it's actually making it more difficult, I think, some of the discussions to pull people into the, the century. And, and I think if you make promises that may not be, uh, you can't live up to them, it just it helps people to live in the past. So I think that folks my age are probably not the best ones to influence. It doesn't mean give up on us. I, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, obviously, you want to share information and, and hope people like myself, uh, I, I'd, I'd like to think I, I'm actually on board, but if I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, people my age sometimes are in certain areas of the country especially might be less likely. If they've, if they've had a bad experience in losing manufacturing uh, and don't have the opportunity to get into advanced manufacturing or some of these, some of these careers, it's hard to see that, and it's not their fault, but it's just, just a uh, case, uh, you know, it's just a fact. So what I would suggest is a couple things. First of all, we've spent a lot of time developing our, uh, uh, our, our every, uh, every year annually we have uh, Manufacturing Day. And we're really encouraging employers and industries and, 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 and edu the education system to get more, more involved and in really helping to use that, not only during that day or that week or that month, but all the time to open the doors up so people can touch and feel. So too many times advanced manufacturers keep their doors closed. Don't want anybody knowing what we're doing. Might lose that trade secret or whatever, right? Open the doors up. Let people touch and feel it. It's well worth the effort to, to uh, uh, create a little excitement. Invite the school, the K through 12 people to come in. That's why we're targeting fourth grade, right, with the robotics. Uh, go, go right to the target audience. Um, the, uh, uh, the other thing is I, I don't think we do a good job at, from an advertisement perspective, of generating, uh, generating uh, excitement. Picture a really cool ad campaign with Bruno Mars jumping off his motorcycle, go, jumping in and going to work in a factory, high-fiving somebody, uh, and, and coming out, jumping on his motorcycle while the music is playing and, and having a really cool job that's going to change the world and with robots running, et cetera. You know, that type of thing. We just don't do a good job at leveraging uh, the ways that we communicate and even the use of social media. We just don't target the, the younger audience uh, uh, enough to excite them. The other thing is that our school systems raise our children. You know, our parents are working two jobs or doing whatever they do, or single parents, or, or, or sometimes parents don't even raise our children, but they spend a lot of time in school, usually, hopefully. So that's where you want to affect them as well, right? So uh, um, I think, doesn't mean, again, with all due respect to my generation and people that look like me and don't give up on me, but really go after the target audience. Uh, and that's really what I think is uh, uh, kind of the approach. And there's ways that we can all partner to do that as well. Thank you. One quick response. I, I definitely agree with a lot of what you're saying. Unfortunately, fourth graders can't vote. 
and that's a big problem in terms of but moving things. I'm going to counter you, though. How's this? I, it's like a debate. Now I'm comfortable. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Because we're definitely so, on the same page. So, so, but you know what? They will vote. If Very we do it right, they will vote. And the ones that are voting right now, I don't think they're going to change their vote in two or three or four or five or six years. We have to start now. It's not an easy road. It's a longer road, but it's, I think, the most effective road. Go after them. All right. Thank you. Good evening. Hi. Uh, Kirk Nestus. I'm the CEO of Hiesel Associates in Syracuse, New York. Welcome. Um, we actually, among other things, had the honor of being the external evaluator for the TACT project that SUNY did and really enjoyed that work. Um, but what we're finding, and I, I think maybe because there's a certain portion of the audience that is in the research and evaluation business, what we're finding is that while NSF gets it in terms of the imperative to study these innovations and try and understand how they're working, we find less uh, enthusiasm for that in the private sector, in uh, uh, the judicial branch, in the executive branch. Uh, it's very spotty. And uh, there's a temptation right now, I think, across the nation for some folks to say, well, we know it works. We don't need to gather data. We don't need to test these innovations and actually you know, make sure that they actually accomplish what they're supposed to accomplish. And I'm wondering, since you're connected with a lot of these constituencies, what's your sense of the appetite for that? And what do we need to do to try and, and continue that mission to not only develop these, in, these innovative programs, but to actually try and understand how they're working, for whom they're working, what we need to do to make them work better, understand context, actually assess outcomes. You know, we struggled with the TACT projects to understand if they were really making a difference because data was so darn hard to get. So I'm just wondering if, what your reflection is on that particular piece of the puzzle for all the researchers and evaluators in the audience. Yeah, um, thank you. That's, that's another really great question. So um, I would suggest that when we make investments and when there are, are grants and when we engage people in uh, various pr projects, that we need to do a better job at clearly articulating what is required when it comes to reporting. We don't do a really good job of that, having clear metrics that are flexible, by the way, because many times, as you all know, that have been through the process, you know, they, initially there's, this is what we want you to do, this is what we're shooting for, people put in proposals. Many times schools don't really have the meat to the bones. Why put all that time in it unless you know you're going to win the proposal? And then you really dig down deep, right? So you have to have flexibility on both sides. What it takes to actually, what's the goal? What's the best way? Don't be afraid to say, and I know, I know because of my interactions with NSF and other agencies, it's okay to go and say, you know what? We think we're off a little bit. There's a better way to do that. That's actually welcomed. But I think we do need to track, um, uh, have metrics, but track them better and make it really clear up front. That's one thing. As far as the... Uh, uh, just kind of what's happening today with people maybe losing interest or thinking that they don't need to focus in some of the areas related to data. I, I, what I try to do is help people create a visual, use global foundries, or, or talk about telecommunications, 5G, the next generation of communications, what it takes to enable that. Internet of things. People think of all the things, right? They think about the things you can touch. Look at it as an iceberg. Think of the data that has to move underneath the iceberg to be collected, to be analyzed, to be leveraged, used, to enable the system right from the thing, but all the way through the communications network across the piece. Uh, so whenever somebody thinks that they have it when it comes to automation or when it comes to even sometimes I talk to people, we have a great program for technical expertise. Guess what? They might have foundational capabilities coming out, but the technology uh, is moving so fast ahead of them that the workforce is never going to keep up unless you keep your eye on the ball. Paint some visuals, iceberg, uh, the, the iceberg. Global foundries, 3 million square feet under rooftop in the advanced node fab, 500,000 square feet of clean room space. We're moving to extreme ultraviolet uh, uh, lithography, which is we're going to be able to produce at seven and five nanometers is, is the goal, which is, I mean, subatomic in nature. But for people to think that they can make $92,000 a year and not be on their A game, forget it, right? We have to, we have to really talk about it in real terms. Uh, yes, there's 
all manufacturers aren't that advanced, but this morning, I'm kind of bookended here, this morning I spoke at a conference uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, advanced manufacturing and robotics. And the small and medium-sized manufacturers are, ch if they're already in business, they're challenged because it's really costly to upgrade when it comes to automation. If you're thinking about going into business, they don't really have a clue on how to get there, how to automate. Then they're, always, they're, they're very concerned about the workforce as well. We need to paint pictures. So whenever somebody gets comfortable, which is happening now, and I think it's caused by you know, some environmental uh, concerns, not small e environmental, and what's happening with some of the current dynamic, but we need to give them some visuals. Um, and I, I guess people like us can't give up. You know, it was, it, I, I went, I've been involved in manufacturing for 30 years, bef a couple careers uh, before I, was, I did a lot of work in manufacturing, and, and I remember I had a, did a lot of uh, speaking around the country, and it was like an echo chamber. Nobody, nobody needed me. It's going to be a service economy. Didn't need manufacturing. And then in the last few years, there was a huge resurgence. And all those people, you talk about the folks within the administration that had careers in trying to advance manufacturing, right? Um, they're like, wow, it's finally here. The train, everybody's beating their chests. And now all of a sudden, we're starting to feel a little concerned again that maybe people are taking things for granted. Don't give up. If it was easy, everybody would want to do it. Good. Help us convince the powers that be, unlike NSF who do get it, that we have to have funding in order to answer those hard questions. So, I'll do my part. Everybody, everybody on that same bandwidth there? Oh, yeah. All right. Good. Well, thank you. Appreciate your support. Hi, uh, good evening. I'm Lori Miller McNeil from Westchester Community College in New York. And uh, thank you for all the good work you're doing in upstate New York and all the wonderful uh, collaboration that's taking place between industry and education. Uh, to be real practical and pragmatic, we're just getting started with our photonics center at Westchester. What are the three or four things that uh, you can uh, share with us that, that we all should be asking industry that we're involved with uh, when we go back and we're working with our industry partners, what are the three or four really most focused, cogent things that we need to know as educators uh, from our industry partners so that we can begin to translate that into our programs at the community college level? So whenever we talk, when you talk about something like photonics, which is now, uh, there's a lot of interest and it will be growing. So it's, it's, uh, there's new technologies, things to discover, right? Uh, I think it's really important. Industries generally don't spend money unless they know, unless it's needed right now. They can see where, where there's going to be a payback. So the value proposition that you bring to the table is helping to make sure that that workforce is in place, even though it precedes some of their investments. So having that frank discussion with the HR departments, with the uh, technical vitality groups, learning and development groups, uh, where you say, listen, uh, we're not here to ask you what the foundational skills are. That's the same for everybody. We get that. But with the direction that it's going in our research projects and as we develop technologies, how can we be, of, you have to ask the question to the specific interest, because the, the answer is going to be a little bit different, uh, depending on who you talk to. How can we provide value to stay ahead of the curve? Because we know that photonics is going to hit. When it does hit, how can we, where do you want to be with regard to the education and workforce development piece? And have that discussion. A lot of times businesses uh, trying to compete globally, they don't have the bandwidth, they don't have the time to have that discussion. You have to spoon feed them. They're not going to spend money in advance. You have to make it really easy on them. And if they know that you're not wasting their time and that, they, that it, it, their, their opinion is really valued and your goal is to make it easy on them and to make sure that the education is di driven by demand, then, then uh, that'll, that'll get them at the table. The other thing, there's a great resource that we do have that's still uh, funded. We spend a lot of work trying to keep it funded, but the Manufacturing Extension Partnerships. Some of them are really effective around the country, others maybe not so effective, but bottom line is they're, they're a great resource. Engaging them in the process to help to communicate more broadly to the manufacturer to manufacturers is really a great. It really makes sense. We don't have that many tools in the toolbox. They're a great tool. 
uh, under NIST, under the Department of Commerce. So uh, there's two government plugs today. How's that? So my, and my, I don't have many friends. Maybe I'll have a couple by the end of the day. But that, that would be, does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. Those are really good resources. And sometimes it's hard to, uh, I think the challenge is always uh, translating the opportunity into action um, because there's lots of opportunity, but you want it to be actionable, you want it to result in a positive educational experience that leads somewhere for the students, and you want to be responsive to, to business. You've got to make all those connections happen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a couple degrees of separation, and mm -hmm. it's you have to keep staying at the table and keep pushing the hard questions or the important questions so that you can narrow the scope and, and, and make the partnerships work for everyone. And absolutely, and I'll tell you, if you get a model on how to make that as effective and easy as possible, whether you leverage MEPS or not, scaling that makes sense too. You know, you know, as we come up with these best practices, regardless of what they're for, what interaction they're surrounding, I'm a big fan of scaling best practices and figuring out how to sustain them, institutionalize them, et cetera, and this is a great example of that. So when you figure out exactly the most effective way to do that, next year you're going to come back and share it. All right. All right. Thank you. Hi, my name is Katie Adams, and I've had the privilege of working and supporting several ATE centers over the past several years, primarily the Southeast Maritime and Transportation Smart Center. I know I believe that Global Foundries has a factory in Germany. Is that correct? Interest? Correct. Um, I was wondering if you would speak to the model of apprenticeship um, for, uh, regarding workforce development. The Smart Center, um, their scalable maritime technologies pathways based on the registered apprenticeship model. And I'm wondering, um, as there's been more interest in this model with this administration as an employer um, and within an industry that has a base of knowledge in workforce development with the European uh, familiarity with apprenticeship, I'm wondering if there's something that you can share with the community that AT centers want to maybe look differently at apprenticeship as a model for knowledge transfer and exactly hands-on, minds-on um, sort of approach to workforce development? Mm -hmm. Sure. So what our approach has been is, first of all, we, we, we stood up an internal apprenticeship program not registered based on all the best practices to really meet our needs. And we said what we want to do is make sure we're up and running and have that in place. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. And then what we said is let's share that with our, uh, our friends and uh, other stakeholders in the education world and academia to see if we can develop a model and, and, you know, and, and, and really scale some of that work. So that's been our approach. SUNY's doing great work, They're gonna, and, and I really think we're going to get somewhere throughout the state and, and move it across the nation. There's a lot of good work being done in other states as well. How do we bring it together? So from our perspective, uh, having... Uh, a, a mechanism, and we do, to effectively qualify and quantify the skill sets of incoming, whether they be candidates or new hires, yeah. right? Think of training existing employees that are now on the train or those that are are going to get on the train. Could be veterans with skill sets. How do you how do you how do you measure what their knowledge base, what they have, and then how do you fill the gap? So it, it's you're not wasting energy or time, but in fact, they could jump on a, a three-year program and be two years down the road. And their one year is not going to look the same as it will will be for another person, right? Um, so those are the key foundational attributes of our program. Um, and what we do is uh, we, we, we've, over time, when I say time, remember startup, right? Only eight, only eight, or, eight or nine years here, right? The, uh, but over time, what we've done is we've taken the, those common threads of gaps, if you will, the common gaps, and we've built curriculum around that and shared it with the education ecosystem so that we begin to introduce it in their school system. So when they come in, it's they're already further up the chain, which allows us to target on more of the technical pieces. So it helps to develop, it helps to develop the ecosystem. It helps you be more competitive. People already have the skill. What's nice about those t skills is that once they practice them, there's theory and practice. Once they get beyond theory, they're into practice, they do a little practicing before they come in, it doesn't take much, they run with it. 
Um, and, and, and I'll tell you, our vet I can't say enough for, for people that have been in the military. If you're talking about showing up for work every day, following processes and protocols, being proud of their work, et cetera, undervalued population, they, and, and I think it's incumbent on us all to really give them, they shouldn't be coming here looking for work, right, after they serve our country. And I'll tell you, they, the, uh, uh, it's diff <laughs> war is always difficult, but especially in today's day and age, it's, it's you know, so, and it's gonna be never ending. But great, uh, we have what's called a field of fab initiative. And we have a 10% target for, for vet veterans. And that we, we hit, uh, hit every year we hit our 10% our target, hit or exceed. So uh, that's really kind of what we do. So really having, helping industry develop on their own, right? Best practices and programs. Helping them share, know how to share that with their supply chains. Right, so their their entire because that benefits them and their ecosystem. Then use that to drive program development yeah. instead of doing it the other way. I think what we've been guilty of in the past is too many times we depend on the ecosystem to develop the programs and meet needs, <laughs> while we're trying to just keep the lights on and keep the roof on, and we don't have time to actually do that. And that's short-sighted. Stop fighting the fires, build it internally, and then use that to to work with program folks to develop the programs. Okay, thank you. Okay, one more. Hi. Hi, my name is Joseph Moreau. I actually am a student at Palm Beach State College, and my question to you is the theory of the forum this weekend is hands-on, minds-on. Having a hands-on approach of being a leader in manufacturing and in business, what mistakes have you made in your lifetime that you would actually give encouragement to millennials so that way we can actually go in the next generation and not repeat the same mistakes of the history? Mm -hmm. Oh boy. You know it wasn't going to be easy. Well, being humble enough to, to admit that you've made mistakes and a lot of them is first. Humility is really, really powerful. Second of all, it goes back to what I said about I like to really listen to older people and some of my best friends are much older than I have been. Listen. Gain experience, gain expertise, and keep an open mind. That's absolutely important. And, and what we, what's happening today in, in the world in general is People, it's interesting because we thought with the onset of the internet years ago that people have more access to information and we'd all be smarter. It's not working that way. It's not working that way. People get tuned into their channel or to their, their spectrum or their bandwidth or, or whatever. You know, I, I listen to like, I love it when people, they're inclined, humans, we're inclined to go where there's like-minded people and listen to them. Wrong approach. So I would encourage people as they're coming, they're, they're earlier on in their lives, to resist that human instinct, be open-minded, listen to others. That diversity of thought and diversity of mind and respect for each other makes you stronger as a person, makes you stronger to employers. It'll make you strong. No matter what you do in life, you will be stronger. The other thing I'd say is, you know, too many, people, too many times people look for leadership. The leader has to tell me. I would, I would probably close with, with one comment, that I think the greatest attribute of any leader I don't care if you're leading the military, a Girl Scout troop, trying to get your child to empty the garbage. You're trying to motivate people. The greatest attribute of any leader is to surround yourself with good people and motivate them. And I would argue that we are all leaders, regardless how old, of how old we are, where we come from, whether you're in a leader, quote unquote, big L leadership position or not. Act like leaders, try to motivate those around you and surround yourself with good people. Keep an open mind uh, and, and uh, I think that's the best advice I could give you. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. I ask something? Okay, so I just want to ask everybody who is involved in either a robotics competition, and that could also in include remotely operated vehicles, anyone who's working in a fab lab, anyone who's uh, it, uh, gone out and directly involved veterans, is working with small to medium-sized manufacturers, maybe some of the MEPs, stand up, please. Good work. Yeah. I wanted you to see that. So thank you, and thank you, All Mike. Right. That thank was great. So All right, thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right, so. Uh, so with that, there is no longer anything standing between you and the showcase and the, the buffet. So, uh, so I hope everybody knows their way to the exhibit hall, and uh, I look forward to seeing everyone there. <laughs>